Welcome, everybody, to the third edition of the Science Po Major Round Arbitration Lecture. As you probably know, this joint venture between Major Round and Science Po Law School is closely linked with our program, LLM program on cross-national arbitration and dispute settlement. We have uh, many law firms uh, collaborating with this program. And in general, those law firms normally offer to our students uh, workshops on particular uh, practical issues of international arbitration or international dispute settlement in general. And uh, some of them also offer internships for our students. In the case of uh, Maya Raum, we went a little bit further because some years ago, we decided together uh, to try to offer to not only for our students, but in general for the arbitral community and in general for our colleagues uh, in law schools, this possibility to have discussions on really uh, hot issues and presented by the most important actors of international dispute settlement. We started three years ago, or two years ago, with uh, Alexi Mouk uh, on a topic on procedure. Last year, we had here in this same setting, uh, Pierre Mayer talking about justice, uh, in particular, the justice as a goal for international arbitrators. And now we have Gabriel kaufman Kohler professor emerita at the University of Geneva to talk about the relationship between domestic courts and international arbitral tribunals uh, and with the question that this is a relationship of cooperation or a relationship of coordination. I noticed that uh, in these three, uh, three editions, we had always a question mark in the title. So maybe that is at the West not uh, on purpose, but I think maybe that is indicating that together with our partners in, in, in my round, we think always in topics um, which are really open, which put maybe more questions than the answers they can provide for. So, uh, provided that we have mm, maybe the most appropriate speaker for this topic today, uh, I will give the floor immediately to uh, my colleague in my round, Dani Kayat, to introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. Thank you very much, Professor Kola, for being with us today. It is an honor for us. It is an honor because you have accepted this invitation despite everybody's crazy schedules and we were talking how crazier they have become in the recent past. So thank you for this. Thank you also for making it in person. This, is, uh, this was a, a very considerable surprise, a very good surprise for us. It uh, brought, brings us back to some sense of normality, which we will hope we will have very soon. So thank you for being present with us today in Paris. Um, Professor kaufman Kolo, despite what Diego uh, Fernandez just said, you do not need any introduction. Uh, of course, everybody uh, knows you, everybody knows that you are the founding partner of Lev B. kaufman Kolo, that you have been the, the past president of ICA, that you are still the honorary president of ICA, that you have been the president of the Association of, uh, for Swiss Arbitration, the ASA, that you are the honorary president of this association, that you are extremely active in the academic field by um, um, or uh, by having founded the, uh, the, the, pro the, the graduate program at the Geneva Law School and having led also the midst where many students, including students that we have had in this room, have come, uh, truly a program of excellence. All of this is extremely well known to the public, so I will not dwell on that. I can simply say from my, from my experience, one word about uh, you. I've, we ha I've, never, I've never been in a tribunal before you, so I can just say this in even in even an, an easier way than others. Uh, what is striking when people talk about you or, or say your name is that there is a sense of uh, um, cohesion around you. 
you are often, of course, uh, presented or proposed as a, as a president of an arbitral tribunal. Sometimes choices are not easy, but when it comes to your name, then all of a sudden it becomes easier, except perhaps for certain investors that may have some, some issues with certain corruption allegations. That is certainly some, uh, slightly more difficult in light of certain decisions that you have rendered. But in, in, in general and in most situations, uh, what comes to mind when, when your name comes um, in, in terms of choosing presidents or arbitrators is fairness. And everybody agrees with that, and this is what I think the most important characteristic of an arbitrator, and specifically of the president of an arbitral tribunal. You are extremely fair, and we are delighted that you are here to talk about a very difficult subject, a very difficult subject that is um, a challenge to all of us when we are when we are faced with investment treaty arbitrations, and that is, as Diego mentioned, the uh, interplay between national courts and investment treaty tribunals. I will uh, give you the floor, uh, Professor kaufman Kolo. But just before that, one word, one word simply of, uh, um, of mourning uh, in memorial of, of in, in the memory of uh, Professor Emmanuel Gaillard, who passed away, and had, whose uh, passing away has shocked all of us. Uh, Emmanuel Gaillard was, of course, a fantastic practitioner, an excellent uh, um, academic, and an extraordinary speaker. And he would have been perhaps delighted to have a debate. Uh, among those subjects which are, of course, of interest to all of us. Thank you, Professor. We leave the floor to you and we will have the debate with our distinguished guests just after that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Danny. Thank you, uh, Diego and, and Maya Brown for the, for the introduction. I'm, I'm moved by uh, uh, the memory of Emmanuel. Uh, it is true that uh, it was a shock and uh, we continue to be shocked by his just not being here anymore. He's, but he will remain uh, an inspiration and uh, his legacy is huge. It is, it is a pleasure for me and an honor, of course, to deliver this uh, lecture. Uh, I would have preferred everybody being in the same room, but, uh, but we are privileged to have this means of communication. And I'm, for my part, uh, very happy to be here in person uh, together with the organizers and the panelists. Actually, I, I left Paris uh, just after, after giving my seminar at the Sciences Po uh, LLM on the late afternoon of Friday, 13th of March last year. The uh, first lockdown had just been announced the night before to start on the, on the following Monday. And I was standing there at Gare de Lyon waiting for my train and having this strange feeling that I might not come back for a long time. And uh, indeed, the COVID uh, kept me away for a full 14 months. And so I was, uh, I was thrilled uh, at the idea of being back uh, today. And um, this is for me like a glimpse of hope, uh, seeing the light at the end of this pandemic. I have chosen to reflect on uh, the relationship between national courts and investment tribunals. And the idea, uh, uh, emerged after a conversation with some trade and treaty uh, negotiators. And they said, you know, for us, the main difficulty is not to negotiate the treaties. The main difficulty is to get them approved by parliament. And that matched the uh, concerns and the criticism that we have heard since the uh, beginning of the legitimacy debates that actually is ISD really needed? Um, does it not uh, discriminate against uh, local investors? Uh, do we not have courts, especially in uh, well-developed legal systems that can perfectly resolve these disputes? And then it was also that these concerns are also corroborated by, by states uh, re, uh, renegotiating or revoking treaties, uh, in part doing away with investment arbitration or reducing its scope in favor of national courts. So it seemed helpful to me to try and think, to map 
what this relationship is and see how it works. Is it, is it well coordinated? Is it competing? Is it in conflict? How do these uh, two, uh, two types of adjudicatory bodies um, interrelate? And uh, that <laughs> I would like to uh, look at these questions in two uh, parts. The first one, and maybe you can show my first slides. I don't have many slides because uh, being online, uh, I realized that, that if I have slides all the time, you barely see who speaks and, uh, and we have no real communication. Uh, so the first, I, the first part is to uh, map out the current position what are the main interactions and how were they are problematic, how are they uh, dealt with in the current system. And then the second part is to uh, assess the current system as it stands, what are the findings, uh, what are the criticisms, and what uh, is the possible way forward. So let's start with the current position. And of course, you'll, you'll understand that I can only do this in broad brush strokes uh, here. Essentially, there are three areas of interaction. If you can put up the slide, that would be fine. The first, the first one is uh, national courts. Yes, you can put up the slide. Yeah, next one. Uh, the, the first uh, interaction is national courts support and control investment arbitration. The second one is investment arbitrators assess the conduct of national courts when determining uh, international, possible international liability of states. And the third uh, one is that national courts and investment arbitration in certain situations exercise competing uh, jurisdiction. So let's start with the first one. Um, and you can remove the slide. Uh, let's start with the first one, which is support and control. Uh, that's a traditional function of the courts at the seat of the arbitration is to support arbitration and exercise control through annulment of uh, awards. In uh, addition, of course, the courts at, and you're certain, uh, everyone's familiar with this, the courts at the place of enforcement exercise control at the level of enforcement proceedings. In investment arbitration, this, of course, only applies to non-exit arbitration because exit is a self-contained system that does not uh, resort to local court. But still, it is about 40% of uh, all investment arbitrations that are uh, subject to annulment proceedings uh, before national courts. And uh, admittedly, ad uh, annulment grants are limited uh, to jurisdiction, due process, international public policy, uh, and they do not go to the merits of uh, the award. But still, uh, knowing that jurisdiction is challenged in practically every uh, investment arbitration, that many uh, awards are attacked, uh, it, it uh, will arise more and more that national courts will contribute to uh, the interpretation of uh, dispute resolution clauses in treaties. So far, we have been concerned about inconsistent arbitral awards on the same legal issue. Uh, will we, as time goes, become uh, also concerned about inconsistent court decision on the same uh, legal issue, jurisdictional requirements? sometimes even about the same treaty, it could well happen if you have different uh, courts at different seats. And the same, of course, could also occur in respect of uh, treaty, uh, treaty interpretation at the level of uh, the jurisdiction reviewed in enforcement proceedings. So far, courts have rather been supportive of the way uh, arbitrators have interpreted uh, jurisdictional requirements and treaties with exceptions, though uh, it remains to be seen how this will evolve. The second instance of interaction is where investment tribunals determine 
whether the conduct of national courts breach uh, international treaty standards uh, and thereby could engage the international responsibility of the state to which they belong. Uh, the courts are state organs, and as such, of course, can give their acts can give rise to the liability of their state. Uh, the typical standard of protection here is, is denial of justice. Uh, denial of justice claim can only be brought if uh, local remedies have been exhausted, and that is another interaction uh, that in passing we note between national courts and investment tribunals, and that interaction that is a traditional one in international law. You have it in, in diplomatic protection, you have uh, exhaustion of local remedies, also in human rights law, for instance. Now, into, uh, exhaustion of local remedies is required in the context of uh, denial of justice because, uh, because what is at stake is a failure of the judicial system as a whole, and the judicial system as a whole cannot be deemed to have failed if the ways of rectifying its mistakes have not been uh, used. Uh, some awards and some scholars consider that uh, courts can only breach denial of justice as a treaty standard and not other standards, but we do have awards as well and scholars who hold the contrary. There's uh, awards that accept that a court can breach fair and equitable treatment. There are awards that accept that a uh, court can breach expropriation. Uh, the expropriation prohibition or uh, fail to provide effective means to assert uh, investment claims. Uh, I make this easier by not referring to different awards. Uh, it may not be very, it may be a little tedious. Uh, within this uh, interaction of national court of investment tribunal reviewing the conduct of national courts, there is one subcategory which is when uh, investment tribunal assess the uh, domestic judicial decisions in relation to commercial arbitration. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a case, Frontier Petroleum versus Czech Republic, where the allegation was that the state had breached the investment treaty standards by uh, the way the local courts had applied the New York Convention or in Saipan uh, versus Bangladesh, the uh, finding was that the local courts had breached the treaty standards by the way, by abusing their powers, their control powers over arbitration in favor of, uh, to protect the, the local party. Now the third area of interplay is represented by situations where there is a competing jurisdiction. That is situations in which the national court and the investment tribunals both have jurisdiction over the same dispute. Now by same dispute, I mean uh, the a disagreement uh, about a state measure that caused harm. I'm not referring to the uh, test of identity uh, that governs, for instance, in uh, res for you, res judicata purposes. That is a very narrow test, uh, which implies uh, same parties, same facts, same relief, and uh, same uh, cause of action. These overlaps occur because there are different legal bases uh, from uh, which one can claim about the same state measure, and these same legal bases also offer different uh, fora. These uh, different legal bases and, and, and available fora uh, are based uh, here. We're particularly interested in a situation where they're based on national law on one hand, and international investment law on the other. But you can also have uh, the same type, type of concurrence on the 
uh, international level, for instance, between two investment treaties or between, uh, between uh, investment law and human rights law or investment law and trade law. But we will now focus on uh, national uh, and international, a uh, concurrence of national and international uh, bases and forum. Uh, some, some examples to illustrate this third interaction. Uh, the first that comes to mind, of course, is treaty and contract uh, claims. It is a familiar distinction. Uh, Vivendi one versus Argentina is the foundational, foundational case, but there are uh, numerous others. Uh, the same state conduct can breach a contract and can breach a treaty at the same time. Uh, if, uh, depending on the dispute resolution clause in the contract, uh, the uh, investor may bring a claim before local courts or before commercial, in commercial arbitration. And if that investor is also protected by an investment treaty, uh, he, she can uh, file uh, treaty claims as well. Uh, I'm, of course, not ignoring that the liability rule, uh, that liability under contract and treaty are, is governed by different rules, but it remains that the arbitrators and the court or the commercial arbitrators and, or, or the court and the investment tribunal will decide over the same facts and the same economic harm. Another example of competing jurisdiction is the concurrence between administrative constitutional uh, law remedies and treaty claims. Vattenfall versus Germany is, is, is uh, uh, an example. After Fukushima, Germany decided to phase out nuclear energy and Vattenfall, a Swedish uh, 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 state-owned entity operating nuclear plants in Germany, uh, brought on the one hand an exit arbitration under the ECT and on the other a constitutional complaint uh, in Germany seeking in both cases compensation. The Bundesverfassungsgericht, the German Constitutional Court, uh, held that the statute that implemented the phase out uh, in, major, in most parts did conform to the uh, to the uh, Constitution, but that certain restrictions imposed on operators uh, required compensation. And for its part, the exit arbitration, uh, we do not know what the outcome would have been. Uh, we know that it was settled, uh, was, uh, if the reports are correct, a sizable amount of payment. We have seen similar scenarios of constitutional uh, administrative uh, law complaints uh, in concurrence with uh, investment arbitration in the, uh, in the area of renewable energy when, for instance, Spain and the Czech Republic um, changed their uh, investment incentives for renewable energy projects uh, that triggered waves of investment arbitration and also a constitution and constitutional and administrative law claims. As a result, the national courts and the investment tribunal ruled on similar principles of legal certainty, legitimate expectations, but these principles were ruled, uh, rooted in different legal regimes. So how does uh, the current investment framework deal with these competing jurisdictions? There are, of course, general principles of law uh, that seek to avoid the multiplication of proceedings over the same disputes based on the rationale that this uh, entails risk of double recovery, risk of conflicting decisions, and uh, waste of resources, all of which uh, can threaten uh, the like, viability or the credibility and the legitimacy of the system. 
the principle, uh, the, the main principles, of course, are res judicata and abuse of process. The problem is that they are not really suited for the kind of situations that we are reviewing here. Uh, they're either framed in such a way that they uh, use as limited, and that is the, uh, the case for res judicata, or they're, they're framed for a very special uh, um, fact constellation, and that is uh, the case for abuse of process. So I will, rather than looking at these principles, I will rather uh, focus on state practice as it is reflected in investment treaties. Now, many uh, treaties are silent about this type of uh, interaction. And uh, was the consequence that uh, each dispute resolution body that is seized and has jurisdiction must carry out its mandate and issue a, a decision. Other treaties try to organize, or if you prefer, coordinate the interaction. Uh, they do so essentially in two ways, by providing either an alternative or a sequential uh, jurisdiction. The alternative approach implies that the investor can choose between local courts and investment arbitration, and that that choice can be modeled in a uh, fork in the road clause or in a waiver clause. Uh, the, the fork in the road, of course, is more drastic in the sense that once the choice is made, it cannot be undone. Uh, once you have taken one road, you cannot go back, which is why uh, this clause is sometimes also called no U-turn clause. Waivers, by contrast, allow the investor to start local proceedings, and if it is not satisfied, to later start uh, investment arbitration. Uh, once it does so, then it must withdraw uh, all existing proceedings, other proceedings, and uh, waive future ones. Uh, Article 26 of ICSID is such a waiver, for instance. The waiver in general seems preferable, at least to me, over the fork in the road because it does not discourage local proceedings. And, and we do know that uh, many investment disputes are uh, resolved finally at the local level. The other approach that treaties take is the sequential approach that mandates that the investor first goes before domestic courts before starting investment arbitration. That can be done by a traditional uh, exhaustion of local remedies rule, which incidentally seems to have regained popularity in, in recent treaties. Uh, if partial exhaustion is deemed sufficient, then you would have uh, the treaty would provide for a local uh, domestic litigation requirement limited to a certain duration, like, uh, for instance, the 18 months time period that we know from a number of uh, Argentine uh, BITs. From a legal point, uh, from a legal theoretical point of view, these two approaches have a distinct significance. Uh, the alternative approach means that states consider that the national courts and investment tribunals are equivalent in the sense that either can give the final solution to uh, the dispute. Uh, so there's no hierarchy between the two. And it is different uh, for the sequential approach that implies that uh, the international remedy is superior to uh, the national courts as it is the one that eventually controls uh, the outcome of the dispute. At that coordination or of competing jurisdiction raises one primary question with which uh, tribunals have struggled uh, a lot. To what exactly does it apply in simple terms, that is the question. Well, it certainly applies to the same factual matrix because we are speaking about the same state measure. But does it also uh, require that the claims arise from the same legal basis? 
uh, reverting to my uh, illustrations a, a while ago, do, do, does it require that, uh, does it apply regardless of whether the claims are administered are treaty or contract claims, regardless of whether they're treaty or administrative constitutional law claims? And do parties need to be uh, the same? What if the local investment vehicle brings a claim and uh, brings a contract and an administrative law claim, and their shareholder brings an investment treaty uh, proceeding? Well, of course, the treaty wording will, uh, will, of course, dictate the answer. But what if the treaty is unspecific? Uh, most tribunals have applied a rather stringent identity test. Uh, there, there, there is, for instance, one decision, Patekniki versus Albania, uh, by contrast, focused on the fundamental basis of the claim and applied a fork in the road uh, clause to uh, bar jurisdiction over claims that had the same subject matter than the contract claims brought before the national courts. Uh, certain treaties, uh, more recent treaties, also give to their waiver clauses uh, a broader coverage, and I'll can come back to this in a moment. That uh, leads to my second part, which attempts to assess uh, the current system. What findings can we draw from these interactions? Uh, what about uh, the criticisms that we hear? And what is the way forward? And in terms of finding, we have identified areas of coordination that is essentially the first and the second interaction and one area of competition, which is the third interaction. The first interaction, national courts in aid and control of uh, investment arbitration uh, contributes to a fair and operational uh, ISDS system. Uh, if it may be that some aspects does, uh, deserve improvements, but these are technicalities. They're not uh, systemic issues. Uh, the second interaction, uh, international responsibility through court conduct, is also, I would say, uncontroversial. If changes are desired, they can be implemented at the level of treaty wording or application interpretation of treaties, but they're not matters of system design. Uh, the third interaction about the uh, competing jurisdiction is different. It, it does question the efficiency of the system. It carries some inefficiencies and potential tensions and conflicts. And this, this interaction probably requires some, some uh, work in, with the goal of uh, improvement. Now, does, do these findings uh, conform to the current criticism that we hear? And I, I mentioned them at the beginning, no need for investor state arbitration because courts can do the job and a discrimination against local investors. I, I don't think really that arises from uh, the, the system as it operates. It, it does not, uh, it is a result of the, these criticisms are a result of the existence of ISDS itself, not of the way it is uh, designed. But that, of course, does not uh, absolve us from trying to uh, look at the, uh, at the criticism and, and determine whether they are justified or not. Uh, let's address the unequal uh, treatment of uh, local investors first. Uh, the idea that foreign investors should not enjoy more rights was put forward by a number of important actors, such as the European Parliament or the Australian uh, government. 
It has led some states uh, to eliminate the distinction between the two. Uh, South Africa, for instance, has revoked uh, most of its investment treaties and protects investments uh, through national legislation that applies equally to uh, local and foreign investors. It does not provide for arbitration, only for uh, court litigation. But there are also other views, and, and one a significant one is the one of the European Court and its opinion on the compatibility of uh, with EU law of the uh, investment dispute resolution uh, mechanism in uh, CETA. The uh, European Court did not see ISDS as preferential the treatment, but rather as, as a way of leveling the playing field between foreigners and locals. It, it, it also stressed the importance of the independence of these tribunals and of the access that, uh, to them for foreign investors as, I, I quote, inextricably linked to the objectives of free and fair trade. So that leads to the second criticism, namely that ISDS is not needed at all. Uh, to assess this concern, it may be useful to recall why it was created in the first place. One reason that is often alleged is that it uh, improves investment flows, but the empirical research is not conclusive and it's probably more plausible to say that a number of factors influence an investor's decision uh, to invest in a country. Yet, it can probably also be said that the existence of an international mechanism to settle disputes inspires confidence. And I also think, although I have no empirical evidence for this, uh, only anecdotal one, that uh, the existence of the mechanism does uh, involve a preventive effect in the sense that states take these protections into account when they uh, frame their regulatory action uh, that may impact foreign investments. Another reason for establishing investment arbitration was to depoliticize disputes or in other ways to remove it from the political sphere of diplomatic protection. And that is certainly uh, diplomatic protection with all the drawbacks that we know. And uh, that is certainly a justification that remains. Still another, and now we come to our topic, was to offer an alternative forum for uh, dom to domestic courts. That appears like an important goal, and before doing away uh, with uh, investment arbitration or other uh, international mechanisms, states should carefully weigh uh, the costs and benefits of entrusting the resolution of cross-border disputes uh, exclusively to domestic courts. A particular concern is, of course, judicial independence and the risk of governments, uh, in government interference. Annual studies, such as the Global Competitiveness Report of the World Economic Forum or the Justice Corps Board of the EU, show that a number of states, uh, even EU member states, uh, there is still uh, significant challenges in terms of independence of courts, or at least the perception of independence. Uh, these elements are probably sufficient to convince this audience uh, that an international dispute settlement mechanism is uh, des desirable. Yet that says nothing about its form. Uh, and that leads me to uh, looking at the reforms that are currently envisaged or that could be contemplated. Uh, do, they, do they address these interactions or do they not? Uh, how would they uh, change the position? Uh, 
uh, was in uh, working group three of UNCETRAL, which is the main multilateral forum where uh, reforms are being discussed. Two reform tracks are uh, being worked on. The first deals with so-called incremental reforms, that is reforms that augment or improve the status quo of existing arbitration. Uh, and the second uh, track looks at structural reforms, essentially the creation of a multilateral investment court or the uh, superposition of uh, an appellate mechanism on the existing uh, system. Now, what will these reforms bring in terms of the interactions that we uh, discuss here? Um, the incremental reforms first, uh, they include things like the adoption of a code of conduct for adjudicators, possible changes to the method of appointment of arbitrators, and an array of uh, amendments of arbitration rules. Th this will not change the interactions of, as we have uh, outlined them here. The structural reforms uh, may bring some change. For instance, the introduction of an appellate mechanism would affect the first interaction of uh, the court, national court's control function and uh, over arbitral award. Uh, for instance, a question that will have to be resolved here is how to deal with annulment proceedings. It should be avoided to have a three-level process with first instance appeal and then uh, annulment. So one would need to integrate the annulment into uh, the appeal. This would require distinct adjustments depending on whether uh, we speak about uh, exit or non-exit arbitration. Uh, the creation of a multilateral investment court would entail uh, wider changes. Uh, the, the role of the courts in the first interaction, support control, would probably completely disappear. And uh, the second interaction would not be changed. The third one, about competing jurisdiction, uh, there are different avenues are conceivable. Either the investment court simply takes the place of investment arbitration and any jurisdictional requirement embodied in the applicable treaties would apply in the same fashion to a court than they do today to an investment tribunal. Or the statute of the courts, that is the other possibility, uh, provides some additional requirements, could, for instance, provide a broad waiver clause, uh, and that would then uh, change the, the, the current uh, jurisdictional requirements. Uh, a good uh, example for this a model would be Article 25 of the Exit Convention that also adds uh, adds jurisdictional requirements to uh, the those that we find in investment treaties. The statute could also, uh, the statute of the court could also allow for flexibility, leaving the choice to states whether they want to uh, add additional uh, uh, requirements or not. Now. In addition to these reforms, or at least to the incremental or and appeal options, or, e or even irrespective of these reforms, the could, states could also, in new or amended investment treaties, incorporate requirements seeking to diminish the inefficiencies that result from the third interaction. Uh, they should, I would submit, prefer waivers over fork in the road clauses when they try to uh, organize the competition and use broad uh, language uh, for the waiver clauses. A good example for this is Article 822 of the CETA, which I have set out on a on a slide because uh, it's easier for you to capture. As you see it there, uh, the, yes, that's, that's it, thank you. Uh, 
that is a broad language in the sense that it refers to tribunal or court under domestic or international law, and then it describes the identity as with respect to a measure alleged to constitute a breach uh, under this treaty. So, uh, so that is that would be a, a, a good inspiration. If we go further to the next slide, uh, you see that it also seeks to capture the situation of the shareholder and the local vehicle who both brings, bring claims at uh, different levels. What uh, states could also envisage is something that we know from court litigation, those of you who are familiar with uh, civil litigation, know Article 30 of the Brussels Regulation 1 that uh, provides for a possibility for courts to stay pending the outcome of a related action or exception de connexité in French. Uh, there we also have a possible model which is found in Article 824 of CETA, which I have also set out on a sl slide. Uh, you see here, this is limited to the interaction uh, between two uh, proceedings based on international agreements. But uh, you, could, uh, you could think of expanding this to uh, national legal uh, basis. And it requires, as you see, that the tribunal does stay, shall stay, uh, maybe one could say may stay and leave uh, and have a discretionary uh, suspension rule rather than a mandatory one. So time flies and I must get to a close after having assessed uh, the uh, existing system. What, what emerges uh, from this review is a, is a complex investment protection system for which investment tribunals and national courts share responsibilities. Some are well coordinated, others are less and may uh, require improvement. In, uh, the, the system actually has grown organically over time and was the result that in some areas, the allocation of tasks is uh, rational and effective, and in other, there is coordination, if you prefer uh, using uh, uh, the, the, the notions of my title. And, but in others, the division of labor is, is suboptimal, and uh, that creates uh, inefficiencies and risks of, of tension, or there is competition, uh, if you prefer. And in the latter area, uh, improvement is, is needed towards uh, the end goal, which is always to uh, reach a fair and efficient administration of justice. We've tried to identify a few possible improvements, but I'm sure uh, there are many others, and you, you will have others, other ideas. And I thank you for the attention, and I do look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Kofron Kora. This was a very insightful discussion, a very uh, broad um, uh, panorama of a very difficult subject in which we've all been um, all struggling with, <laughs> certainly as, as counsel, this is for certain, but perhaps as well uh, as an arbitrator to render the best possible decision in light of very complex set of facts and competing set of facts, as you have mentioned. With us here to, um, not only with us, but also remotely with us, are um, uh, three uh, very well-known and very experienced practitioners in international law that will be debating your views, Professor Goffman Koro, or questioning your views, answering questions from the, from the audience. Uh, some of you have already sent questions, and of course we encourage others to continue uh, doing so. Uh, let me start by presenting those who will be uh, uh, participating in this debate. First, remotely, we have uh, Maris Toyanov, 
who could not uh, be here with us uh, today. Uh, she is a partner, Marie, you're a partner at the Allen and Overy uh, in the Paris office. You're uh, an experienced practitioner, both in investment treaty arbitration, commercial arbitration as well, but you've been representing states and investors in a variety of cases, including pending ones. Thank you for being with us, uh, Marie. Uh, here as well, we have uh, uh, Judge Dominique Asher. Uh, Mr. Mr. Asher, you're uh, a judge at the Court of Cassation, the, the, the Court of Cassation. You've been formerly the president of the Court of Appeal uh, of Paris, and of course, as such, you've been extremely active on the arbitration from in, in the French courts, but also uh, as part of uh, exit tribunals, including ad hoc committees, and I'm sure you will have many things to say about the interaction between the courts, generally speaking, and perhaps the French courts more specifically, and investment treaty arbitration. Uh, last but not least, Eduardo Silva Romero. Uh, Eduardo Silva Romero leads the arbitration practice at uh, Deckert. You're a very experienced practitioner in investment treaty arbitration, just like Barista Renov, you represent uh, states, but also investors in a variety of cases. You've also been the Deputy Secretary General of the, uh, of the ICC Court of International Arbitration. Thank you very much, all of you, for being with us. Of course, uh, my colleague and friend Diego Fernandez Arroyo is here with us, co-moderating with me uh, this panel. We will be asking you questions, um, all of you, including you, Professor Kofman Perl, if you still agree to continue sharing sure. your insights. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and maybe I can start with a general overview from the from the from the participants in 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 light of what you've been uh, sharing with us, Professor Kofman. I'm not leaving. I'm just looking for a pen. Of course, we don't expect you to leave. You're absolutely <laughs> here to, to defend to defend the uh, certain of the certain of the positions that you've uh, laid out for us. But in your absence, perhaps I can uh, start by asking uh, Eduardo, do you have any uh, reactions to the panorama that uh, Professor kaufman Corner has laid out for us? Well, let me, first of all, uh, Danny and Diego, thank you very much for uh, the invitation uh, to, be, to be here. And uh, let me thank uh, Gabriel for the, the wonderful presentation that we just uh, heard. Uh, I made many, many notes uh, while uh, Gabriel was, uh, of course, speaking, and I I'll, uh, I'll summarize them very rapidly, not to eat uh, too much time. Um, regarding the interaction, the first part of uh, Gabriel's presentation, I, I thought of, of the following ideas. Uh, first, regarding the control of, of the courts over investment arbitration, and more specifically of investment awards, uh, it strikes me that the role of the courts in controlling commercial awards is different from the role of uh, controlling investment awards, and more specifically in relation to jurisdictional problems. Uh, in a contractual setting, uh, we are speaking about a simpler issue of consent. Uh, we know that investment arbitration we also have an issue of consent, but it's more complicated. The treaties uh, contain more issues, uh, et cetera. So the question that I have asked myself in, in relation to this specific problem is whether uh, courts uh, shouldn't have uh, the novel review of investment awards, but rather uh, something similar to what uh, one can find at ICSID, which seems to be um, more limited as, as a control of investment awards. Uh, that's a question, of course, of, of, of leg referenda. Uh, a, a second issue uh, is more a small anecdote. Um, before the Republic of Colombia can ratify uh, an investment treaty, uh, there is a requirement in the Constitution, which is that the, the Constitutional Court needs to uh, review the treaty before Colombia can send the notes of ratification. And, uh, and Colombia organizes public hearings, the, the Constitutional Court of Colombia organizes public hearings to discuss with some practitioners issues of the treaties. And it has happened recently in relation, for instance, uh, to the uh, French-Colombian uh, bilateral investment treaty. And so I, I, I had the, the, the honor of participating in that hearing and the only question I got from the judges was the following. Uh, can, uh, are these investment arbitrators entitled to tell us, the Constitutional Court of Colombia, how to behave or whether we 
behaved somehow badly? And this is a difficult question because, as Gabriel mentioned, uh, the case law uh, is hesitant about uh, this issue. Uh, I would have liked to say uh, of they can only do it if there is denial of justice. Uh, but then I thought, when the Constitutional Court would commit a denial of justice or a breach of due process, especially when Constitutional Courts are really analyzing in abstracto some laws to say whether the law is constitutional or not, or the treaty is constitutional or not. So due process has a different meaning in a Constitutional Court uh, uh, proceedings. And uh, now coming to the assessment, the, the second part of uh, Gabriel's presentation, um, uh, what I'm seeing, uh, and I think this is healthy, is that many states, uh, which used to be very, uh, very against um, the investment arbitration uh, proceeding generally, uh, are now trying uh, to ask themselves how to prevent investment disputes from happening. So there is a new trend, uh, I believe, coming from the World Bank of organizing in many states what is called uh, the Ombudsperson of the Investment, which is a, um, a superhero that uh, solves the problem of the investors before they become legal disputes, something which is not nice for um, lawyers, but is probably good for, for states. Uh, regarding the appellate mechanism, uh, I must confess uh, this is uh, an idea that I used to like, but most recently uh, the problem I see is the time that it would take uh, for an investment arbitration to occur, given how complex these investment arbitrations are, and then a second investment arbitration on appeal uh, to decide that. How, how many years are we speaking about? Probably six, seven uh, at best. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't look like uh, feasible. Uh, regarding the investment court, uh, uh, there are many things to say. Um, I'm not certain uh, investors um, uh, will like it. Uh, it depends on how it is, uh, it is built, uh, but without the investors using it, um, it, it will not have any, any success. And, and last point on, on the assessment, I also have the impression that um, many investors, uh, instead of um, betting on investment arbitration, are trying to negotiate uh, contracts with uh, arbitration clauses in it, ICC or other institutions uh, being chosen uh, because it's easier at the end to have a commercial arbitration than investment arbitration. So I, I, I end my, my comments uh, with a point uh, uh, which comes from, from, I don't know if all or many uh, Gabriel's uh, investment awards, uh, which in my view uh, is uh, really part of the solution. Um, in, um, in many decisions, and it was by, by Gabriel kaufmann Cola, there is a statement at the beginning uh, saying that the tribunal considers that, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> the tribunal uh, must consider the trends of case law investment arbitration because it has a duty of consistency towards the community of the states uh, and investors. Uh, and I, I believe uh, this awareness um, is part of what investment arbitrators should be doing um, to show to the states and the investors that uh, uh, the solutions uh, could be limited in, in number. Uh, there might be questions where there are two positions, but hopefully, over time, uh, the case will evolve so that there is a, a more clarity and more legal certainty. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Um, instead of giving the floor to all the moderator, all the participants, and of course, Professor Kafranker will have so many questions to, to, to answer to. Perhaps, uh, Professor Kafranker, if you have any quick reactions to any of the points that uh, Eduardo has raised, or we can uh, pass on the floor to, to the other participants, it is as you wish. You're the moderator, so I, I do like whatever to, I, you tell me to do. I no, I can it. react on a few yeah, things. Yeah, to... yeah, because then it's fresh also in absolutely. the minds, absolutely. Um, the, on the difference of the national 
courts, reviewing awards, uh, in annulment, in commercial and investment arbitration. I, it's true I had skipped this part because it became too long. But uh, it, it is different to me. It's in part different because the national courts uh, generally review jurisdiction, arbitral jurisdiction under their own law or some national law. But here it, they apply international law. So some may be familiar with it, others may not. Um, and uh, there is no issue of consistency, right? Because you will always have a different contract and a different applicable law uh, or, or a national law. Here you could have the same treaty that in London and in Paris and in, in Switzerland would be interpreted differently by the highest court. What I don't know either is to what extent uh, arbitrators will take into account not only other awards, but also court decisions. I suppose they will waste time. But it is true that listening to the oral debates of the Swiss uh, Federal Tribunal, uh, which ruled on one of my awards, I was very surprised by some statements that were made that we would not have made here because, because somehow it showed the lack of familiarity, which does not mean that we should escape uh, review, right? I mean, we, we have to be humble enough to uh, accept that the awards are, are being challenged and are being reviewed by others. But uh, it, it, it is something that may merit some more thought. Um, the prevention uh, and, uh, of disputes and the Ombudsman, which we find, for instance, in the Brazilian CFAS. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also this strong tendency, and in working group three, it was very clear uh, of states to uh, wish for more mediation. And maybe this, it's a general trend, was the Singapore Convention. We, we have the New York Convention in the 20th century, and then of 21st century, we have the Singapore Convention on mediation. So maybe that, that is a trend. Um, I share the views on the appellate mechanism. <laughs> to me, if you really want something institutional, then do a court. And then uh, we have something as, as rational as possible. The, the appellate mechanism will not resolve the issues of the lack, that are seen as lack of legitimacy of the first instance level, and they will add a lot of time and, uh, and costs. And it's difficult to see an investor who has lost who will not use the appeal if the appeal is available, and the same thing for a state. So, uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, maybe I stop here. There was one additional point. The um, fact that investors more and more uh, try to negotiate commercial arbitration clauses that to me is a good reason to maintain a system of investment arbitration because otherwise you will have those investors who are powerful enough to have an arbitration clause and then you have SMEs or private people who don't have the leverage and then are left to go to before uh, national courts. So, yeah. That's Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. May I uh, now give the floor to Marie Stoyanov, who is with us remotely, for her comments and potential questions as well. Marie? Thank you very much, uh, Denny. I hope you can hear me well. My apologies for not being physically with you this evening. Um, I will need to be a bit more careful than you, Denny, because I have actually outlet in front of Gabrielle, and indeed the decision <laughs> of the Swiss Federal Court that she just mentioned, um, I know very well for my sins. Um, it, just picking up on that last, uh, or one of the, the last discussions about the difference in control that the local courts um, may impose on arbitral awards, depending on whether we're talking about commercial arbitration or investment treaty arbitration. Now, the laws are the same, of course. Um, it is always in France the same provision of the uh, civil procedure code that will be applied. Um, and in France, at least, we don't apply national law <laughs> to the review of an award of the jurisdiction of the tribunal, at least we apply our um, concept or understanding of international law, international law principles. I 
do accept that, of course, in practice, when we're talking about interpreting consent under an award, under sorry, a treaty, things may be different because, indeed, you may find that same treaty being at issue in challenges before other domestic courts. And there is a question mark over whether that adjudicatory fragmentation is advisable or will inevitably lead to a desire for some harmony and consistency. Um, I would maybe just note that that fragmentation and inconsistency in approaches already exists between domestic courts on a number of different issues that pertain to arbitration. Um, for instance, whether res judicata is part of, of uh, public policy, international public policy, um, and needs to be reviewed by the courts is very different even within EU member states. Uh, the question of whether uh, statute of limitation is a question of jurisdictional admissibility and therefore the degree of review that the court at the seat of the arbitration uh, will apply is very different. Um, the support that a domestic court can give to arbitration in case of denial of justice and therefore stepping into the shoes of the parties or an institution to appoint an arbitrator, again, we have that inconsistency. We haven't been able to improve on that even when given the opportunity in, in the recast Brussels 1 regulation. Um, but there seems to be something very specific about investment treaty arbitration that makes people want to ensure consistency, even though that is not a fact of life or indeed of justice. Um, and I just wonder whether it isn't a bit of a misplaced concern with the fact that a private tribunal, as some would call it, is sitting as a judge over measures taken by sovereign states and is able to impose um, damages and sometimes even restitution that then leads to those concerns over that fragmentation and the lack of coordination and the need for, for bigger coordination. Um, uh, and I just wonder whether it was sort of missing the point somewhat, all those criticisms uh, missed the point a bit. Um, I also wonder whether that concern is truly limited to the interplay between domestic courts and investment treaty tribunals, or has it more to do with tribunals that oversee the acts of the states, whether it's con contractual acts or is it their acts as contractual parties or as sovereigns, um, and whether we will not soon have the same discussion over commercial arbitration uh, in over concession agreements, for instance. Um, and is the distinguishing factor really the fact that we're talking about a treaty or the fact that the state's purse uh, is uh, at issue? Um, uh, yes, these are difficult questions, Marie. Um, I see the adjudicatory fragmentation, as you call it, in terms of courts reviewing arbitral awards as more of a concern. Uh, I'm not saying uh, it will not, would not be a concern in commercial arbitration if res judicata uh, is part of public policy or is not, and how do you characterize statute of limitation and the like. But it is more of a concern here because we, we're talking about investment, not just about general principles of law, but whether investment treaties, uh, how to interpret investment treaties that uh, have recurrent issues, right? We all, we all agree that if the tr treaty is different, then the treaty is different and, and, and the solution may be different. But if the issue is the same, can you apply MFN to uh, dispute resolution? Um, a number of issues with respect to uh, definition of investment, with respect to definition of investors, come up all the time. And, uh, and sometimes come up in respect of the same treaties. And if there we have inconsistencies, to me this discredits the system really. I mean, how can I trust the system that produces contradictory results? And, and it is in part the situation now we have seen on some issues we, we know well that, uh, that uh, rules have emerged over time, at least majority rules, but on others, 
the, 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 the position is, 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 uh, is uh, divided. Now, was co for courts, it's mainly on jurisdiction that we could have the problem, right? So I, I see, and you're, you're also making a distinction, was, was it not all, is it only about investment treaties? Is it also in investment contracts, especially con uh, concession contracts? Yes, but they may be, yeah, I can see that you may have similar issues, but that is not exactly the same thing to me, like having the same treaty. I may hope I just I understood uh, yes. you well. <laughs> yes, you did. May I just add um, a layer of complication, if, if um, Benny and Diego <laughs> allow me? Um, sure. Another issue that comes up, obviously, a lot, both um, in, in the actual arbitrations, but also then in front of the courts, is the issue of corruption. Um, is consent negated because of corruption, so is there actually a qualifying investment? And we all know that different domestic courts will tackle the issue differently, both in terms of whether a new argument can be made in terms of jurisdiction, as long as there was an objection to jurisdiction made before the arbitral tribunal, but also in terms of the evidence that can be adduced. So taking a bit of a, um, a broad view of the concept of consent and jurisdiction, it seems to me that it may indeed go beyond the strict confines of the interpretation of the treaty and the same provision of the treaty, but also touch upon a same set of facts that is being assessed differently by courts um, at the seat of the arbitration and then courts of enforcement. And I'm not sure we have the answer to that inconsistency at least. No, we, we certainly don't have the answer to any of this. But uh, it seems to me if you speak about uh, uh, new arguments, uh, new evidence, uh, these are all uh, go-to procedure. And, and it's, it's natural that a court will always apply its own procedures. And that procedures may vary from one court to the other. So uh, there's not much of... Uh, solution to this unless you have an investment court and there are no appeals from that investment court and that will have always the same uh, the same uh, rules but obviously uh, that is not not a very realistic view right we all know this that uh, there will always be a patchwork of uh, of dispute settlement uh, bodies Thank you, thank you, uh, Marie, for the questions, and thank you, uh, Professor, for your uh, answers on this. Uh, Mr. Rasha, what uh, what have you, um, what can you, what type of reaction would you have from what you have learned, and per perhaps particularly in respect of the discussion on the local courts and the interplay in terms of annulment, which is a topic that you you know well, or any other aspect that you found of interest. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, my first words uh, would be to, con to congratulate uh, Gabrielle uh, for making a very clear uh, presentation of the very complicated issues. So uh, thank you for, your, uh, for, for this wonderful presentation and, uh, and also uh, raising a number of issues uh, with, uh, and so just let me say, uh, first, I strongly disagree with my friend Eduardo uh, <laughs> who uh, now uh, wants, in addition uh, to all the issues, new issues that we're facing, uh, who wants to change the uh, review system before the, uh, before the national courts as it stands. That is not the uh, exit system uh, as we know. Um, I don't share that view because I think that if it's a question, you know, you know how to ride a bicycle. If you know how to do it, then it also, it's, it's going to come back. So if you're fit uh, to control uh, international commercial, uh, international uh, commercial arbitration awards, uh, then I think you should be prepared also uh, to look at investment boards. Now, certainly, uh, I would think from what I have seen in my own experience uh, is that the major issue is 
what is jurisdiction and when are you started to invade or encroach on substance? That's a, a difficult, perhaps a difficult question for judges who do not have uh, many investment arbitration awards to, uh, to, to control. Uh, otherwise, and this would be a, a, a question to, uh, to, to Gabrielle, uh, certainly uh, courts have will have different views on the same BIT, or even let's broaden and say that you have different BITs, but more or less. You know, you have FET provisions, expropriation, etc. I mean, the, the mechanisms of an investment treaty uh, tends to work the same and be repeated from one BIT to the other. Now, uh, courts may come with different uh, with, with different outcome. Wouldn't you think that the uh, that there must be an effort on the parts of these uh, of the courts that have to overview uh, investment arbitration awards to think how they can look at the central instrument for them for this control, which is the Vienna Convention on Law and Treaty. And you do have provisions in the VCLT or in public and international law in general which uh, call the interpreter of a treaty to make their interpretations more or less harmonized. Do you think this could be an avenue for the courts that they should be, uh, which means that they will have to go into, uh, under comparative law, and, but that's, uh, that is, uh, something which if they if they perhaps took more care or more or had more knowledge about the functioning of the VCNT, that they could harmonize gradually uh, or gradually or now <laughs> <laughs> not even gradually uh, but that they could uh, try to find something which is more uh, which would be more which would make everyone more comfortable with the outcome yeah um so the, your first disagreement was was Eduardo, right? So I'm I'm dispensed with answering <laughs> this one. I will apologize later. Good. <laughs> uh, well, courts uh, certainly do apply uh, the Vienna Convention. Uh, I I. I don't see uh, the Vienna Convention as a magical tool because. Uh, arbitrators also apply the Vienna Convention all the time and they sometimes they pay lip service but sometimes they really engage with it and nevertheless they reach different solutions on on the same issues so does the Vienna Convention I don't think the Vienna Convention really uh, would avoid the the the, um, uh, the risk of uh, different decisions. What will be interesting to see also is to what extent uh, courts do uh, look to the jurisprudence of other courts on similar issues. Uh, maybe they will and that would uh, then kind of institute a sort of judicial dialogue between uh, the courts uh, at different seats, and that could have a harmonizing effect. Yep. Yes. Well, yep. <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah, we <laughs> have it so too. I would hope so. Well, but uh, it is a little bit difficult. It, it is, and that exists. Some courts uh, normally uh, normally does. Yeah. Uh, some courts, yeah. but um, the problem with uh, investment issues is that the state of the court is normally involved in the case. I mean, in general cases, there are some cases where they take in different view on, on this, but normally we are going to a court uh, before which 
the state is one of the part, the, the, the same uh, state to which that could uh, belong to. And that is more difficult for, for many countries. I, and even it is a way to say that even for the more perfect system if that exists, uh, um, and the most uh, respectful country with uh, the independence and, and, and republican principles, it is quite hard for the for the, the court to to act in the same way but as you act in a commercial activity. Then uh, the the role you take for all the impact that can have uh, on on politic issues, uh, public issues. Uh, I agree with that. I, I was uh, thinking of the situation of the review of awards yeah. by a court that generally will be a court. It, I was not thinking of the enforcement court. I was thinking of the annulment court, and that is generally at the seat that is yep. neutral. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it would, the, the, the Okay. Court state would not be involved. They will be different for enforcement. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. So we have several questions from the audience, but perhaps just briefly uh, you know, touching upon what you were just saying in terms of annulment and court proceedings. One thing that came to my mind also in the context of polit depolitization or politicization of disputes is something that, uh, Professor, you have written in a, in a publication that you have authored in terms of the difference between the rate of annulment of investment treaty awards before the French courts and before the Swiss courts, where I was interested to learn that before the Swiss courts, no investment treaty award has ever been annulled. There aren't that many of them. So far. So far, there aren't mm -hmm. that many of them, but nevertheless, it's an interesting statistic as compared to the, to the French courts, where a few have been annulled or partially annulled, including in the recent, in the recent, uh, in the, in recent times. I was wondering whether, well, if you have any comments about this, uh, what, what, where the difference comes from, and perhaps to try to be a little bit controversial, whether you would think, in terms of politicization, whether the French courts or the EU the courts of an EU state would be more inclined to annul in the context of some hostility towards investment treaty arbitration of course, in the wake of the ACME award that we are all aware of. Uh, do you see any, any of that or any difference in terms of the attitude of the courts between Swiss and France? Uh, Professor Lorraine uh, Kasha. Well, Swiss, Swiss courts have always been, as the only one actually that rules on annulments, has always been a very pro arbitration and very against annulment. So there must be something seriously wrong with an award for it to annul. Uh, sometimes you could even think uh, they're a little too, uh, too rigorous in, in the application of the, of the grounds. Um, and it's clear that they do annul mainly for due process issue and the second ground uh, in terms of sta statistics is, is uh, jurisdiction. Now, it, it has struck me that so far there have been a good number of investment arbitrations going before the Swiss Federal Tribunal, and so far none has been annulled, but it could change tomorrow. And uh, there, there were more annulments in, in, in French courts uh, recently. Mm -hmm. And I, but I don't know, uh, and I would not dare in front of Dominique making statements about the French courts because I, I don't know them enough to know what the true reasons are for this apparent uh, difference in attitude. Let's put it that way. Yes, I think you do. Uh, <laughs> well. Uh, the, uh, the difference between the two systems is that um, in Switzerland there's just one tier, so you just have to look at the uh, judgments of the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Uh, in France, as you know, there are a number of court of appeals that may have the possibility to make decisions. Then it goes to the, uh, to the Court de Cassation, to the Supreme Judicial Court, and uh, then we make the, uh, we do not make the final decision, but we may quash. And we have quashed a number of decisions of uh, lower courts uh, on, investment, uh, on investment awards. So these cases are 
have been remanded for the moment, and uh, we'll see what happens. But so uh, I'm I'm slightly hesitant about making immediately a comparison uh, because we are still working in it, and it's perhaps not in such a final state as the uh, Swiss uh, as the Swiss federal court uh, judgments. Uh, are today, but uh, just to uh, I, I will, if I may, just add a word that when I have when I'm the uh, so-called reporter uh, on those uh, on, on investment awards, uh, I certainly uh, make the most to make myself uh, aware of the decisions and the judgments of the uh, Swiss Federal Tribunal. Uh, just to see how they've been, how they reacted, how they treated the issue, uh, even if it's not the same, uh, it may not be at all the same award, but nonetheless, uh, I think it's, for me, quite enlightening to see how they've done. So, well, you are coordination. You are quite exceptional. Coordination. Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, thank you both. So turning to the questions from the audience, we have a few, and of course, if there was an audience live here, you know, they would, they would be asking the questions themselves, so it is only fair that I read them out and not try to paraphrase what has been asked. So we have a question from Arno Geldemeister. Um, Professor Kofrankola, could you imagine a system in which national and international systems interact akin to the ECJ approach to preliminary, to preliminary questions, i.e. in a form of dialogue? The question has intrigued academics and practitioners with a view to the ECJ and arbitration concerning EU law specifically. But other situations could be envisaged as well. For example, I have encountered a similar question in the context of the competent authority procedure under bilateral tax treaties and disputes which are related both to tax and investment treaties. Further, a form of dialogue between national and international bodies could also be envisaged, at least conceptually, rather than just providing for priority rules waiver, withdrawal, suspension. Could a, multilateral invest, could, could a multilateral investment court bring about further opportunities in this respect? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. <laughs> Many years ago, I had written that it would be good, rather than doing an appeal in investment arbitration, to have a sort of preliminary ruling procedure, because that is, that is uh, something that has worked well for the uniformization of European law, and I thought maybe it could also work well for investment law. Nobody really seemed interested in the proposal, so <laughs> kind of went away. Uh, uh, now here, this situation, the, the question is a little different because it goes more to the cooperation between uh, national courts and, uh, and some international body. I would have to not clear in my mind how this would exactly work. I would have to think about it, yes. The investment court, of course, could have also some kind of preliminary ruling or opinion type function, like an advisory opinion, for instance. Uh, that's certainly open. Uh, how this would interact with national courts, I, I would have to think further. Thank you. Through the magic of, uh, of the internet, I know that Marie Stoyanov has a <laughs> comment on this aspect. Um, yes, we of course know of a somewhat similar system, at least under the English Arbitration Act, where you can ask an appeal on a preliminary point of law. Yeah. Uh, but that is because the English courts are terribly well placed to interpret questions of English law. Um, and so the question would be for an arbitral tribunal that has to decide a dispute under an international treaty, to whom could they refer the question on the proper interpretation of a given provision in that treaty. Um, and so the only real um, forum would be a joint interpretation by the two contracting parties. Um, and some, as you know, some treaties or the audience know, some treaties do provide for that. Um, but there are very few treaties outside NAFTA, uh, and it's, it's successful that do that. Um, but that could be an avenue. Uh, for a harmonization of interpretation, but that would be left then completely 
was in the hands of the contracting parties to the treaty, from whom at least arguably the investor derived their rights anyway. But I, like you, Gabriel, I don't quite see how the national courts, and if so, which one, um, could intervene to give a ruling on a preliminary question of that sort. The, uh, the, the joint interpretation avenue is, is very much emphasized in the reforms, uh, maybe because it has something to do with the return of the state, right? The state wants to take control back over its treaties, and so they rather have uh, uh, them uh, make a decision rather than, uh, than arbitral tribunals on the interpretation. But uh, at the same time, this would really be treaty by treaty, so it would not help the fragmentation uh, across the board horizontally between treaties on same legal issues. So, yeah. Thank you. Another question uh, from uh, Eliseo Castaneda to all of you, primarily to you, Professor. One area of coordination or competition is climate change mitigation and biodiversity preservation, which both come hand in hand with energy policies. Are you aware of investment tribunals already dealing with the impact of state court decisions which have ordered government, governments to take action to mitigate climate change, e.g. in the Netherlands or in France, and which together with the Paris Agreement can impact investors' legitimate expectations of public policy defenses, to the extent you can answer this question. <laughs> no, I cannot, because I don't know. <laughs> But others may know better than I do. I'm, I'm not aware of any, no. any case like that. No. Well, obviously, there has been a lot of discussion. There will be, yes. Like... There will be some coming, I suspect, uh, <laughs> in, in the next few years. Um, there will have been some at least similar set of events when you just look at the protection of the environment more generally, not, not climate change. Um, and there they are. There is some jurisprudence uh, on that. Um, but so far, at least in the energy sector, I think those non-renewable uh, energy investors were not faced with that type of defence. Um, and the recent cases, as Gabriel said, is, was, were very much in the renewable energy sector, so by definition, um, could not be faced with, with that argument. Thank you. One, one topic that uh, you did not touch upon, Professor, and I was wondering uh, why is that? is the, um, uh, well, under the heading of national courts, what could, one could consider also criminal courts. And of course, it touches upon aspects of corruption, but not only uh, aspects of corruption. So the interplay between the criminal courts and investment treaty tribunals is, of course, something that is uh, widely known. And of course, you, all of you here have had to deal with those aspects. Is there, a, do you treat this uh, interplay differently? for the purposes of today's discussion, or is it a completely separate area um, in your mind? Well, I, I looked at, at least in competing jurisdiction, I looked at uh, situations where courts and tribunals deal with the same dispute, that is, the consequences of a, a state action that caused harm and, and therefore uh, compensation is sought. And criminal uh, proceedings are, of course, different. I had thought, but I have not addressed it here because it would have opened a whole new uh, box about uh, injunctions against uh, criminal proceedings. Of course, there's a good number of uh, investment tribunals that have enjoined or been asked to enjoin uh, criminal proceedings. And, and to what extent do they can they uh, impact the integrity of the arbitration? And these issues are certainly issues that I could have dealt with. Thank you. But I have not. <laughs> Thank you. Well, something interesting in relation to this interaction between criminal proceedings and investment arbitration is uh, perhaps a trend that is, uh, is appearing uh, in tribunals um, assessing the legality of the investment. Um, of looking at what has happened in the host state, uh, meaning whether there are criminal proceedings there, 
when someone comments criminal proceedings there on the facts given rise to the illegality allegations, uh, if not, perhaps the allegation of corruption is not that credible coming from the state. If yes, and uh, the criminal court hasn't found anything in some time, perhaps the allegation is not very credible. So that, that is interesting, uh, this deference, di different, different deference that uh, investment tribunals are, are paying to, uh, to criminal courts on the basis that criminal courts have more investigation powers than uh, an investment tribunal in the host state. And yes, that they do this, and maybe they also look to the seriousness of the allegation and mm -hmm. the consistency of the state's conduct. Because yes. if the com state raises corruption in investment arbitration as a defense, but then uh, does not uh, start criminal mm -hmm. proceedings, it looks it may look a little opportunistic and not not serious yes. and, and there are awards that that I say that. this yes. yeah. Diego? well there are some questions uh, but I, I would like to go back to the, the discussion about the the case law and and the the, the role of case law uh, which became certainly very important in, 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 in investment uh, and you know very well that and, and uh, I, what do you think about uh, the, the same role for state courts because um, we have uh, now uh, this powerful role of, of uh, arbitral awards and I'm not sure that it could be the same for, for a state decision neutral or non neutral what do you, how do you see well, this, this issue? Which, which courts do you have in mind? If we limit it to courts at the seat on annulment, hmm. for instance, on jurisdictional issues, then I don't really see why these court decisions could not have uh, weight as well as much than as, uh, some investment awards. If you speak so for more of, of, for instance, of uh, constitutional or administrative law decisions, even of the highest courts of the host country, then can these have the same weight, less certain? They are certainly considered by tribunals, but how do yeah. they uh, well, but factor in? Particular, in? Uh, but the, the, the effect for the building uh, jurisprudence, uh, transnational jurisprudence? Uh, the fact is that these types of national decisions will be made uh, under national law, and so it may be more difficult to transpose them to mm -hmm. the international plane. That's, that's uh, one of the yeah. points, right? Yeah. And in, in any event, you know, the, the, the picture is, I think, is symptomatic because Competition seems what we know, so that it is realistic. The other thing, cycling competition that, that doesn't exist. <laughs> One question from the from the audience, uh, dear Professor Kofmankola, we have been talking about inconsistent decisions on annulment or enforcement across dif different national courts, but isn't that inevitable? Given that, given that they are applying different national laws on, for instance, public policy, would the multilateral investment court review process potentially avoid such inconsistencies given it would, that it would still be a standing body applying the same law? Do we, see, do we see inconsistencies in decisions before, for example, the French or English courts when reviewing ISDS awards? I must say that I have not done the exercise. Uh, but it would be interesting to do it. But then you have to take what, to compare what is comparable. You would have to look at the dispute settlement clause in the treaty and see whether it is interpreted differently uh, by uh, one court and by another. If you look at international public policy, then you will have different understandings yeah. of international po public policy on the different 
national laws, right? Because international, unless you have transnational or truly international public policy in mind, uh, there will be differences. So that cannot really be compared. If I may just add one point to that, because we talk about challenges to awards, of course, but there's also an inconsistency in approaches at the enforcement stage with some courts that will, for instance, stay the enforcement pending the outcome of a challenge at the seat, all the way up, a very famous case, the Dutch uh, Supreme Court, and others that will not, and that will say it is not stayed under the local procedural rules, and therefore I, as the enforcement court, will also not stay in the enforcement. Um, and that opens a whole host of other difficulties then, um, and, and leads to uh, obvious foreign shopping in terms of enforcement. Yeah, and the stay is, of course, uh, in the essence of the procedural rules of a court. So you don't really see how this can be harmonized. Each court will apply its rules, and it will create differences. Yes, yeah. that's right. That, that was the sense of my previous question. Right. I have a question about uh, I have a question about waivers uh, because you did uh, you did mention them and you did I think said that you were probably a proponent of them at least over fork in the road in terms of how to address the inconsistencies and the and the way forward. In practice, you know, advising investors, waiver is a very difficult um, um, decision to make, and one of the issues that we've been uh, you know sometimes grappling with is one of timing. Certain treaties have a waiver, but that waiver is enshrined within a certain period of time. So after three years, etc., so one can understand the rationale behind it. But if there is a waiver requirement and no timing, that makes it complicated in terms of decision making for the investor. Is it a good time to uh, to waive? How much more do we have to wait? Do we have to wait for the whole process before the state or not? Will the state say you just waived while you're going to have a decision six months later? Etc. It's a, it's a very compl uh, in practice. I find it very complicated. I I can see this as 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 a difficult decision indeed. And sometimes I'm not sure if that is what you have in mind. It is a combined with a, sta a relatively short statute of limitation yes. under the treaty. Mm -hmm. yes. And when you have both, uh, you I can see that you're kind of caught. Uh, in between uh, the two, for instance, the Indian uh, model bit has this combination that m makes it practically impossible to file your claim. So I can see this past, this difficulty with waivers. Uh, I have no no clear view on, on this. What I certainly think is that waivers are better than. Uh, fork in the road, because fork in the road really forces you uh, to go to inter investment arbitration right away, even though you may have a chance in local, uh, in local proceedings, because otherwise you may not be uh, uh, allowed to proceed with the investment arbitration. It may then depend on how uh, the, the clause is interpreted, but you, you don't know this in advance, so you don't want to take the risk. Perhaps one question in terms of provisional measures, and um, uh, of course uh, others may have other questions. So uh, provisional measures is something that you have touched upon and others have also uh, mentioned it. Um, that is an area of, of competition, I, I would say. And uh, when you were speaking about how the uh, state apparatus or generally the state uh, would react to how an investment treaty tribunal takes a decision, I think they may react badly also when it comes to a provisional measure. So um, would, the, would, the, would the reform um, also um, uh, address provisional measures? If so, that would be viewed negatively by the investors. Uh, so I wonder if that is something that needs to be taken into account in the potential reforms, while from the point of view of the investor, it is a very interesting tool. I must confess that I don't remember now proposals on provisional measures. I'm not sure there are any pending right now. Yeah. The, the beauty of provisional measures and, and that you have the alternative possibility of going before local courts or going to the arbitrators uh, is 
at least in commercial arbitration, is very useful. And uh, so far, it well, under exit that uh, there is there's a consideration, of course, that it's barred by the Article Twenty Six. Yeah, yeah. But otherwise, it it does not, or it depends on the local arbitration law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something I, I, I have observed uh, as a reaction from some states uh, regarding interim measures, some hostility towards that, uh, comes from the fact that um, the Washington Convention refers to recommendations of interim measures and uh, or provisional measures. I mean, and we, we shouldn't enter into that discussion. Uh, but they, they didn't expect investment tribunals to order in exit arbitration, provisional measures against the states, because they see in the text recommendation, and then you look at the history, and the, there is some reasoning behind why the word recommendation was was chosen. And as a result, it was very interesting uh, to note when the ICC worked uh, on the review of the rules in 2012, uh, when the ICC wanted to promote uh, ICC investment arbitration. Um, the reaction from some states saying, we don't want ICC arbitration for a variety of reasons, but one of these reasons was because in 2012, the ICC was introducing the emergency arbitrator mechanism. That, that is something the state really didn't want to have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the recommendation wording is always... Uh, creating some misunderstandings. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Although I think we know empirically that states have generally followed the recommendation of investment tribunals. I wonder if this is also your uh, empiric view of, uh, of, <laughs> no, your, of your I'm not sure they have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I'm not sure they have. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much. We um, can end it here unless anybody has anything uh, to add. Uh, uh, Diego and I sincerely thank all, all of you, Professor Kofmankoro, of course, Eduardo Silva Romero, Dominika Scher, and Maris Toyanov for this uh, very interesting debate. Uh, we were very uh, happy and uh, extremely um, grateful for you to be here. Thank you very much for all the, the information you've shared with us. We look forward for more in other settings in person uh, next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.